Okay, guys, we are uh, going to go ahead and get kicked off. So, Christos, first of all, you can breathe <laughs> in this room compared to your room yesterday. Yeah, that was, that was a packed house, wasn't it? Yeah, we, we had a little uh, near riot incident in uh, Christos' session yesterday where, what were you talking about? What was the topic? Uh, eventual consistency doesn't equal hopeful consistency. Uh, okay, yeah. so we had... Uh, we had a little little problem with the seating with the fire marshal saying you guys can't pack uh, 150 people into a 70 person room. So, um, but it was a fantastic session and you're just good, a, good. A, a great spokesman for not just Cassandra, but this whole shift in moving from uh, a couple of different database technologies mm -hmm. to what I'm starting to call polyglot persistence, where yep. you're gonna end up with a lot of different diverse technologies. But you guys have done, um, Definitely what I would consider the extreme right now, you guys are leading the pack in terms of your migrations, and that comes with a lot of risk. So we're going to talk about that today. These formats, for those that weren't in yesterday, they're very conversational. Um, think about questions as we're going through, and I'll try and pause along the way and take a few questions um, about midpoint, and we'll, we'll try and make it interactive. It's better if you have questions, so just think about them and be ready to ask. So before we get kicked off, why don't sure. you give us a a rundown on uh, who you are and Great. what you do at Netflix, Perfect. and uh, that'll be a good starting point. Perfect. Uh, so uh, my name's Christos Kalanzis. I manage the cloud persistence engineering team, which is a fancy word for the Cassandra team, uh, but we run it in the cloud, so we've got uh, you know a very interesting setup. Um, my background, I'm, I'm a DBA, I'm an RDBMS DBA. I started with SQL Server, then moved on to DB2, went the open source with MySQL, and you know, quickly, um, quickly found that you know, there's, there's a ceiling to these technologies, and Murphy's Laws you know, can only save you once or twice. Uh, so eventually you gotta scale out. And um, so in, 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 my, you know, in my search uh, to find uh, you know, a good technology, that's where I, I became familiar with uh, Cassandra. And, um, and, and I started using Cassandra back when you guys were called Reptano, yeah. actually. And so uh, that's when, where my relationship with, uh, with Cassandra and, and Datastack started, more as somebody who took training and really liked the product, um, you know, tried to get it into my last company. That didn't work out as, 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 as I've shared that story. I kept on telling him, hey, Netflix is doing it. Netflix is doing it. And he, you know, my CTO said, well, why don't you go work for Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> so here I am, a year and a half later. <laughs> you, know, you know, but our topic today, and uh, we try and be pretty open in these sessions. We try and get mm -hmm. to the heart of the, what the real problems are. Um, I, without naming names and mm -hmm. you know, no, mudslinging, yeah. uh, we are going to talk about risk and risks to career. That's kind of a good jump in point, and then we'll come back and get back on track. But one of the risks associated with um, not moving aggressively in this market is companies lose people like Christos, right? And so you, you left because of a frustration, and that's never good to lose nope. your key employees, right? So that's one of the things that is going to have to be balanced in this equation is not just your own personal risk when you're making these decisions, but the risk to the people around you and under you who have to do the work, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to have a hard time retaining them. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, um, a lot of decisions are, are being made now, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's bottoms up. It's, uh, it's not top down anymore. And these are very talented people. If, if they leave, I mean, you're stuck. And, 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 and it's, it's kind of that paradigm where you're disenfranchising people who don't agree with you, so you're just left with yes men. And, 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 and if you ask me, that's the biggest risk. You want feedback. A, 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 an enlightened executive will take all that feedback and listen to everybody and, and make the appropriate decision. So we've done a lot of interviews together. We, we do, uh, Chris Austin and I will do interviews with sometimes big mainstream publications. We just did one with USA Today, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes with analysts and tech people. And invariably, invariably, this comes up every time. He'll be describing the use case, and, and then they'll sort of give a condescending bit of a tone, and they'll say, yeah, but you guys are Netflix, and n nobody else is really Netflix. What do you say to the normal companies out there? And I always watch you get a little, little cringe. You tighten up a little bit. Your hair gets up on your back a little bit. <laughs> You're a real evangelist for the movement in general, and, and, I, and I'll watch you move out of your Netflix hat, and you will go into full-on evangelist load. Why are you so passionate? about this movement and getting people to think about taking risks 
what they're doing inside their companies because it, it's more than just a Netflix thing with you. I can tell mm -hmm. it's, in, it's mm -hmm. in your DNA. Yeah, uh, it's not a Netflix thing. You don't have to be Netflix. You don't have to be Google. You don't have to be Facebook to, to have a big data problem. Uh, there are there are one two year startups that that are facing this this problem, and, and, and to have blinders on and think, oh no, I'm not big enough to to move away from my you know single RDBMS, uh, it, it's short sighted. It's it's really short sighted, and you know, uh, it, it, if you don't do it at, at the point where uh, you can invest the time to do it right. It's going to be too late, and then, and then you're just going to be struggling. And, and, and I talk from frustration because I was in that position. You know, you're telling me, you're seeing the horizon, you're seeing it coming, and, and you're like, hey, man, that, that database, okay, fine, we'll shard it, but now it's an operational nightmare. I mean, it's, it, it, puts, it puts your engineers in a bad spot, and I just feel for them, and that's why, uh, you know, I'm a huge evangelist of don't do it. it you don't have to do it perfect in the first iteration. Get out the door, get your VC funding, fine, I understand. Do a POC, prove it. But do think about the size, uh, the size and the scalability of your persistence layer very early in the cycle of your company because uh, by the time you need it, it might be too late. So I've had uh, probably six conversations at the show. Some of you are probably in the room with whom I've had the conversations. Um, I have these on a regular basis. Let's talk about a, a problem that with no easy answer. And the problem is sometimes an executive gets this and they see the problem, they see the horizon, and more importantly, a lot of times they see the competition. And they start to understand if we don't make these moves, we are going to get left behind fast, both in the actual market and the product and in the talent land grab. Because mm -hmm. right now I can tell you, I don't know how many of you are Valley companies, but I moved here two years ago, and um, when, when Walmart puts up billboards advertising to developers, there's a problem with hiring, right? Like, the, the, the engineering talent out here is at a, at a premium right now, so, but here's the situation. That executive has to go back to their business and try and break through years slash decades of now institutionalized beliefs and patterns on, no, 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 this is how we do things. And we were just talking this morning mm -hmm. about a very mm -hmm. big use mm -hmm. case where the product team, this is, a, this is an absolute true story, the product team completed the prototype, were ready to roll into production. The C-level brought in an SVP level under them, and the SVP walked in after a year of work and told the team, I am not putting anything in production that doesn't have the name Oracle on it. And the team was livid and ended up losing several of them. And it's going to be even worse now. And the interesting thing about it, the people who were the most angry were the people who were, used to be Oracle DBAs. And they're like, no, no, <laughs> fine for that part of the app, but not in this part of the app. But here's the deal. They're under intense pressure in the organization to maybe have that conversation of go work at Netflix, right? So yeah. are you immune from that kind of risk at Netflix? Or you guys push all barriers all the time. Is there any political risk at all? Can you identify at all with those executives who are fighting this two and three decades worth of, of status quo from the institution? Uh, probably not at Netflix. Netflix pushes the uh, prides itself in pushing the envelope to, uh, from a technology point of view. Um, we have a little bit of RDBMS, but it, it's nothing mission critical, and it's mostly internal systems that you, we just want to you know, uh, hash out really quick. And, and, and the moment they do need to, to scale, you know, or or be in a multi data center scenario, it goes to you know we'll we'll switch it to Cassandra um, uh, pretty easily. But I have seen it in previous companies. I mean, every, everybody's heard the old adage: nobody gets fired for buying IBM. Uh, now it, I guess it's Oracle. Yeah. Uh, you know, cho choose your big database uh, provider, monolithic database provider. Um, it, it, it's hard. It, it's very hard. I mean, these VP, you know, these executives uh, who uh, who probably aren't familiar with the technology uh, might not want to take that risk. You know, they, they've got a very you know, in a big Fortune 500 company, have a very cushy VP salary that they don't want to risk. I mean. I'm looking at it as, I, I hope they're retiring soon because they're going to get fired for <laughs> not taking the risk soon. And so, 
Um, it, 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 it's hard. It, it, it's very hard. I, I feel for them. It, it, it's probably they're out of touch with the technology, and so uh, you know, not knowing it is, is instilling fear. But uh, to get back to the question, am I seeing this in Netflix? No, but I've seen it before, and I kind of see where they're coming from. But I'm not going to go down with with that ship, personally. And, and now we're back to the problem of, and, and neither are a lot of your good people. Exactly. So that, that's where you run into the challenge of the thing. So this particular battle of breaking through the challenge of um, the status quo and doing things the old way, it, it, let's call it what it is. It is a career risk. Yeah. Now that risk, I think as humans, we associate immediately the negative connotation of risk, what could happen if it goes wrong, but there's a huge upside mm -hmm. when these projects go right. So talk a little bit about why this particular battle, and it is a battle mm -hmm. at a political level, um, why is this one worth risking your career over in particular? Uh, great question, actually. Um, let's, say, uh, let's say you know, you're, you're a manager, you're a senior manager, and you've got a couple layers on top of you, and that's where the resistance is. Uh, you, you, you fight this battle because one, it's the right thing to do, for the company, assuming you actually care about the company you work for. I, I, li I like to think that most people do. Um, so you want to fight it because it's the right thing to do. Second, um, you know, depending on, on, on you know, your career path and, and what your interests are, hey, you know, it'd be great if you were the hero uh, who, who solved this problem uh, you know, for the company and uh, you know, then let the chips fall where they may. Uh, but, you know, there's also a risk of not doing anything because um, you, it will cost a lot more in, in human effort, in time spent, in operational costs to maintain that, that old uh, database uh, technology and try and make it scale and hack through it and hack through your application. I mean, I mean if you're, if, if you're you know, XYZ Inc. and you're selling widgets, you're, you're not in the business of creating database products or hacking layers on top of it to make it scale. You're in the business of selling widgets. So, I mean, let, let somebody else who's, who's, um, uh, who's, who's a database creator, uh, uh, somebody who, who's creating database software, take care of that for you, and now you can just concentrate on on, uh, on the, the added value you're adding in your, in your, in your uh, software stack to, uh, to sell those widgets better. And, and so it's hard. I mean, in the end, you know, sometimes you'll have to do a proof of concept, improve and, and, and quell some of those fears. Uh, that well, that, that's have. actually another good point. Another debate we were in this morning was, mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, on let's assume for a minute leaving your company isn't an option. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I don't want to underemphasize what a problem that is becoming, okay? It's uh, for your teams of people in your organization, you need to really be cognizant of the problem that could happen where you end up losing all of your A players and the ones who want to stick around are your B and C players. And, and it's going to be very hard for you to then catch up. At that point, you're in a spiral. And it's very hard to then go higher again because talent attracts talent. So getting to the point where you're a co are, are comfortable in the team around you is going to be really critical in your thinking about how you build your plans going forward. So let's assume you are a company person. Sure. You're, you're in, you want to succeed, you want your company to succeed, and now you have to go fight the battle. And you know there are going to be some, some battles to this. Um, practically speaking, there are a couple different ways to make this happen. We have the gateway drug, we have the, the gateway database where you kind of get in with something small and and then it starts to propagate on its own. You have the renegade, the just, we're gonna go do it, we don't care what anybody said, and we're gonna go implement it and prove to you that it works. And then you have the consensus builder. We're gonna go make sure everybody's happy and on board and nobody feels any risk before we do this. And those are the three big buckets of choices yeah. that you kind of have. Mm -hmm. And at our table this morning, we were talking, we had a diverse opinion actually on the way to do that. So practically speaking, if I know I gotta gear up for this fight, and let's say I'm, I'm a mid to high level executive. Uh, what are some practical ways that you would recommend that you think are the most successful? Uh, I'd start off, at, so all three would work. Uh, it really depends on the culture of the company. 
uh, if, if the company does allow for like a Skunk Works project, then do the Renegade approach, do something in there, uh, you, know, uh, you know, show it off, uh, and then you know, other, people, uh, other people will, uh, will look at, um, We'll look at what you're doing and how it scales and say, hey, I want to do that as well. And, and kind of the momentum will build. Um, the safest way is probably, hey, find, find a very low critical application, like a logging application. Or, uh, and, and, you know, start off, you know, port that over to, to Cassandra. You know, give people comfort. Let them, let them get their feet wet. Uh, let your developers get their feet wet as well, and that's, I think, something you want to talk about later as well. Um, let them get comfortable with the product. Uh, and, and I'm not just talking Cassandra, I'm talking anything that's not a monolithic RDBMS. Uh, let, them, um, you know, let them get comfortable with it. A and let the executives get comfortable with the fact that I've got something not Oracle now, and it's working. And, and, oh, and by the way, I, I, I see emails from the ops department, they're up 3 a.m. fighting fires with my Oracle box, but that Cassandra thing's just chugging along and nobody's touching it at all. So, you know, that, that will eventually uh, attract attention from, uh, from executives and then, um, you know, you'll be able to go back and say, hey, okay, cool, we did that logging application, it worked out. Let's, let's start moving up the stack and up uh, you know, the criticality of our applications. And um, th that's worked a lot for, for a lot of companies out here in the Valley. It's, it's a good, so, so Christos and I actually differ on this one a little bit. I, I don't <laughs> think all three work. I think the consensus one is a recipe for failure well, um, in, a, in a highly charged political environment. But as he said, it yeah. depends on the culture. Yeah. Um, the, the one that, the, the, my fear with that approach, which is, is a, certainly a valid approach, I have no logical objection to it. The part that I get concerned about in bigger companies is the amount of time mm. that that can take. Yes. So by the time you get done with getting everybody comfortable with the baby steps, your competition, if, if you're in a company that's making money and you're a big company, there are 50 companies here within a 50 mile radius of this spot that are coming to take your money. And because of the ability to scale in the cloud and get things ramped up fast, they can do it. And so it's going to come, and, and the problem is, it won't actually be a lot of times at your traditional business, it'll be at the parts of your business that are new, fast growing parts of your business, the parts you need to grow for the next five years. So you're looking at it probably demands in, in some portion of your companies for 25% five year CAGR. And you know you're not gonna do that on your, old, on your old product line. So you gotta come up with new inventive ways and that's unfortunately, what's, or fortunately, however you wanna look at it, that's what's happening here in the Valley area. So I, I say that the only caution to that approach is you better move quick. Like, make sure you're talking months, not years, on, on how to move I'm, those I'm things. I'm a little jaded. Netflix, we move in two-week intervals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, we're so not it's, talking <laughs> quarters. I wasn't talking quarters. I was talking take a week, take two weeks, <laughs> move your application, show it off for another week, and then move on to the next one. So, so let's talk about that. You, you have the ability to do that because you have some of the finest engineers in the world. Let's say that you've got a talent pool of people that are... 20 year relational people, right? Mm -hmm. 15, 20 year relational mm -hmm. experts. They're very good at what they do, but it's, it's a paradigm shift mm -hmm. as we've talked about many times. How would you recommend, let's assume for a moment we do want to go with your iterative approach gotcha. and you're going to start a small logging project, yeah. maybe a five person effort. Cool. Would you go and hire in some talent to say, let's start fresh with some people who actually know what they're doing here, or would you start right away by trying to repurpose your existing team and get them trained and transitioned Philosophically, which way would you go? It's a mix, actually. Uh, y y y you want, you, you don't want to start from scratch because they're going to stumble, and especially if you want to move fast, uh, you know, sometimes you don't have time to, to feel your way around. So you want to bring somebody in who will kind of mentor them and, 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 and kind of lead them on that path. And, uh, but you, but, the people who've been there for a very long time, they're your company people. They're, they're the ones who are going to stick around, um, you know, for, for, they've stuck around for the long haul. Uh, hopefully, they'll stick around a little longer, and you want them to retrain because they bought into the whole company. And, and they and have a lot of institutional does. knowledge that's exactly. really valuable, Absolutely. right? Like Absolutely. They've, 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 they've got, got the fires. relationships inside yeah. the company and so on. So you don't want to just clean house and, and replace everyone. Uh, you need a good mix. What that percentage is, it really depends, uh, you know, as a manager, as a director, you really know, you need to know your team and, and, and gauge how, um, 
how, uh, how open to change they are in learning new things. Uh, if, if they're open to it, then, you know, in that five-person team, one or two people being, uh, being mentors will work. If it's, uh, um, if it's a team that, that uh, you know, aren't that open to change, but do know that they gotta begrudgingly go into this direction, then uh, you might want three people uh, from the outside to mentor them, uh, simply because, you know, they might just need a quick, swift, kicking the behind to move in that direction. And, uh, you know, n nothing, nothing will motivate somebody as much as, uh, you know, potentially seeing somebody come in and take their spot. So in, he here's the risk factor associated with this kind of strategy. I'll tell you from personal experience. In 1992, I was a 21-year-old kid, gra just graduated college. And I was on the, what was the disruptive technology back then was Oracle. And so we were implementing a lot of client server systems at the expense of the mainframe. And so the mainframe was ex exactly analogous to the conversations we're having about Oracle today. So we decided to make this big transition. The code name in the company was Whitewater. Now, for those of you old enough to remember, there was another scandal happening in 1992 called Whitewater. With the, with the Clinton administration. It was a sort of an ill-fated name from the beginning. But what they did was they came in and carved us out as a group. And they went as far as to say, you guys can do a different dress code. We're going to put you in a different building. So they relaxed our dress code. They put us in a different building. We were all on uh, RISC 6000, if anybody oh, wow. remembers those, those technologies, the pizza boxes. And we were building all these Oracle systems. The animosity that that created inside the organization was irreparable. It created an us, them, combative mentality of the cool kids and you know, the people who make money and fund the cool kids. And that is the wrong way to do it. I'm a huge fan of integrating your existing teams. Often the final barrier you'll have in your companies is the traditional operational database team. The ones, these are the adults in the room, quite frankly, and they serve a really good role because they have lived through a lot of the changes of, of what can happen in chaotic mm -hmm. environments with no change control process. And they know it's not all rainbows and, and lollipops, that bad things can happen when you do that. If you can win over one or two of those guys in that team You're and sad. bring them in early and say, I want you to be a part of this. I want you to work with us. I need your knowledge. I need your expertise that will help you accelerate your adoption curve so much faster inside of an organization. And by the way, up in your organization, if you go with a plan to say, this is how I'm gonna manage resources, this is how I'm gonna transition my existing, I think I'm gonna need X number of new, but I'm gonna transition Y number of existing, you will be seen as somebody who is mitigating risk, mm -hmm. but being aggressive and moving fast. And, and that will give people comfort who may not have the the, the general sense of adventure <laughs> that, yeah. that you share. So that's my personal experience with it. I don't know if you have any different thoughts on no, that. No, absolutely. I, I was one of those operational DBA guys. And, and, and that's why uh, when I did evaluate Cassandra, I evaluated with that experience of, of um, you know, bad things happen and, and you want something that, that is repairable, that is, that, you know, that you can survive when, some, uh, when something bad happens. And absolutely, you need buy-in from, from those guys. If, if, if you don't have buy-in, because they, they carry a lot of weight. They when do. they walk in the room and they say, hey, I'm seeing a problem here, you know, stop the press. They're, they're the ones who can call stop the presses, you know? Um, and you need their buy-in. You absolutely need their buy-in. And, and the question at that point is, how do you get their buy-in? So you involve right. them. You involve them very early. You don't just you know, go, uh, go blindly forward. You, you, know, you, you have them understand what's going on at every step. Get their input because, I mean, and, and it's not just to keep them engaged. They know a lot of stuff. They do. So, so if they're engaged and if they buy in, that's definitely a recipe for success. Yeah, it's, the, the recurring theme in many of these conversations is the rest of the sessions right now are about the technology. These sessions are often about the people and mm -hmm. the organization yes. and how you think about yeah. and how you communicate the technology. You have to really get a good vocabulary on this stuff because you, it's not going to help from an executive level to go in and talk about compaction and transactions per second. And you're going to have to talk about 
business uptime and customer service and customer experience and mm -hmm. a real-time ability to respond to market changes. That's what you're going to have to communicate up. And then across, you're going to have to communicate how much you're valuable, how much we need you, how much we want your input. Um, but guys, this stuff, it, it matters so much to the success of the project and the success of the company ultimately. So I'm going to take a quick pause on our, on our Q&A to see if there's any questions from the audience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do so, a summary so, so, repeat of the question for the video. Yeah, sure. So the question is, okay, fine. We've heard Netflix is big on Cassandra, but have we ever evaluated and are we currently evaluating other database technologies? Does that summarize the question well? So um, uh, we've been running Cassandra now since 2010. Um, we did evaluate. We evaluated Mongo. We evaluated React. We evaluated... Uh, HBase. I mean, th those are the big, uh, the big, th uh, you know, names other than Cassandra. You always hear when people talk NoSQL. Um, we looked at them. We, we had a very specific use case. You know, we wanted to be number one in the cloud, number two in multiple data centers, and be able to write and replicate across all those data centers. And we wanted it to to be, you know, rock solid, very high available. It had to have a good disaster disaster recovery story. And nothing out there at the time, and, and, and I would argue still, uh, meets all those needs better than Cassandra does. Plus, we're a Java shop, and, and, and Cassandra's written in Java, so, and it's open source. We can roll up our sleeves and, and get in there and fix something, and we fixed a lot of stuff um, uh, in the early days to make it work for, for our use case. Nothing else out there really, really met all those checkpoints for us. And, and, and there still isn't. I mean, w somebody creeped in a little Mongo, actually. Uh, we're talking about, like, renegades getting stuff in. <laughs> about a year ago, somebody creeped in a little Mongo, and, and, and you know, eventually they had a problem with it. And, uh, you know, they didn't have the operational expertise uh, to fix it. And then more they learned about the product, more, you know, they had uh-oh moments, <laughs> you know. And so that's, that's eventually been, uh, been uh, completely ported to Cassandra now. Yeah. So we've. We it sounds like it's even encouraged a little bit at Netflix that it's okay oh, absolutely. to go out. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's okay. Run whatever. I mean, if anyone knows anything about uh, the, the Netflix culture, it's freedom and responsibility. You're free to do whatever you want, but you're responsible for it. Uh, and, um, and, you know, people have experimented and, and they're still experimenting. In the end, it, they, we just all end up going to Cassandra because it's, it's just less of a headache for, uh, for the application developers and for the company as a whole. And, and it's not because we're gateways and we say you gotta do it in Cassandra. Be, uh, it's, it's really, I, t I actually, I give them the rope <laughs> and let them, uh, let them kinda hang themselves with it and then they all come back. <laughs> yes. And if you guys wanna learn more about the Netflix culture, there's actually a, uh, a PowerPoint a that went account. out that went viral a couple of years ago on um, their philosophy on how they do things as a as a company and it's if they, it's on SlideShare uh, it's on SlideShare but you can go to jobs.netflix.com and it's the for all 128 uh, 120 slides are there it goes by fast it you does. can read through it in yeah. about 15 minutes it's it's it's, re it's it's a great read actually it is question yes. It is never a data. No, I'm kidding. Repeat the uh, question, please. So the question is, the question is, uh, you know, Netflix does go down. I mean, Netflix goes down. We're in the cloud. Sometimes there's storms in the cloud. Uh, how, how often is it a database issue? Um, so far, we've never gone down because of a database issue. Uh, I, th I, I think I can talk about this. What happened Christmas Eve last year was related to Amazon, and even Amazon uh, released a mea culpa, you know, a memo saying, yes, it was us, it wasn't them. Um, we do get sometimes uh, misbehaving applications that will overtax the database, so latencies will, uh, latencies will uh, you know, let I'm getting a little technical here, but the, the database won't respond as fast as, as the application expects it to. And then you'll get, you'll get like uh, timeouts uh, at, the, at the web layer. So um, it, 
it's indirectly, it, it, the symptom is at the database, but the problem's in the application. So we, we lose nodes. As a matter of fact, here, here's a very interesting piece uh, of information. We purposely, we have something called Chaos Monkey. If you go to uh, netflix.github.com, this is an open source uh, tool we have. It's called Chaos Monkey, which literally kills nodes in Amazon on purpose to make sure we're that resilient. In production. In production. That's key. In production. <laughs> and Cassandra is one of those targets as well. So we purposely kill Cassandra nodes. We, we do a replication factor of three, so your data's in three different places at the same time, at any one time. So um, we will kill nodes in the Cassandra cluster. And if I remember right, you don't know the node it's going to kill. No, it's it, random. It, it it's randomly, chaos. It's chaos. It literally yeah. randomly just goes out and starts killing Absolutely. production machines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can throttle that up and down. Obviously, uh, I don't want to kill too many. Uh, but uh, no, w w uh, as recently as last quarter, we took part in, t in this. I mean, you can think about it in, in a stateless application layer. Fine, it it's easier to do that. But do you really want to do that in your database? As of last quarter, we are now taking part of that. And we are purposely killing Cassandra nodes in production. Which is one of the things about risk. When you talk about risk, we, we, our customers typically don't talk about disaster recovery. That's sort of out of their vocabulary. They talk about disaster avoidance. Yeah. And so they proactively will kill things to, to mimic what, what they know is going to happen in real life at some point. The other thing about Netflix that they do is when they have outages, they are the most transparent company I have ever seen that details what happened, why it happened, what we're working on to make sure it doesn't happen again. And, and I've actually had some conversations with, with them about this. I'm like, man, do you really, like, is it okay to bet that on Amazon? Because when it goes down, you guys look bad. And by the way, I have to keep explaining. It's not us, right? So uh, every time, and they're like, no, no, no. This is, we know directionally this is where we want to be. Now we just have to keep pushing the boundaries and making it better. And every time we want to learn from it, we want Amazon to learn from it. So that is your culture. You guys That's are a very, um, very, very progressive and innovative as a company and as a culture as a company. That, that is unusual. Most of us probably are not experienced with companies like that. We probably have some mix of traditional in there as well. And, and, and that's not just outside, it's also inside. Uh, if I lose a node and it was unexpected, I'm gonna send out an email uh, to that team and say, oh, by the way, I'm swapping out one of your nodes because there's file corruption or something like that. And, and uh, you know, it, it, most of the time, all the time, it's probably transparent to them, but that's the kind of culture we are. Hey, I found something, I'm gonna swap it, I'm letting you know, you shouldn't see any, anything in your application. If you do, well, this is why, and, and so on. Otherwise, you know, I, I've worked for, for companies where, you know, the ops manager is like, mm, just fix it, don't tell anyone, and, and yeah. only if it blows up will we share that information. That's, that's not the kind of place we are. I think there was another question back there. Yeah, um, I can talk, no, I can talk about that. So the question is, uh, a lot of startups uh, go out with Mongo. Um, uh, they start with Mongo. Uh, my experience is they start with Mongo, they, they, they hit some kind of wall, and then they end up redesigning for, for Cassandra. I know two or three companies, but I mean, I, I don't want to concentrate on that part of your question, uh, on that part. Um, Mongo has, 10Gen and Mongo have done an amazing job of popularizing their APIs. So I'm not putting data stacks down at all or, or the Cassandra community. Uh, you know, J, people think Node.js, and, and sorry guys, I'm throwing out a lot of technical terms here. Uh, people think Node.js immediately, you know, the perception is you want to do it with Mongo and, and because it's JSON, BSON, and stuff like that. Um, they've done a very good job of, of working with the developer community and getting those APIs and making those APIs popular. So a lot of plugins have been created for a lot of uh, development frameworks that, that work great with Mongo. There's one for Grails, there's one for Rails and stuff like that. Um, we actually at Netflix had that problem as well. We weren't happy with the, with the API at the time in 2010 that existed. And we created Astyanix at that point our own internal Java client library uh, that, that you know, helped us overcome the fact that the APIs weren't 
uh, weren't that uh, easy to use uh, at the time in 2010 for Cassandra. So, uh, so get, to get back, I think Tenjin and Tenjin and the Mongo community have done a great uh, job in, in getting those APIs out there and creating a lot of drivers for a lot of different, uh, for a lot of different um, uh, uh, languages and, and, to, and development toolkits. Um, Cassandra's gotten a lot better these days, but it's, it's just one of those things. And I, I can tell you from a personal perspective, I, when I was first, when I, when I came out of school with a computer science degree, I was, databases to me were just a big file system. I really didn't care very much about the relational stuff. I started learning that eventually. Um, the first one I started learning and using was SQL Server, and the reason I did was it was because so, it was so easy to integrate into my Visual Studio environment with, mm -hmm. with Microsoft. It was, just, it was just simple. I got it. As a developer, it made really a lot of sense to me. Oracle, I, I used to, like, we'd have to set aside a day to go do an Oracle installation and pray and then, you know, be ready to call support and work through the god-awful network and support. And it was just, it was rough back then. You had, to, you had to want it to use Oracle. That is exactly the state Cassandra was in in 2010. You had to want it. I mean, you had to want it and you had to be sharp. There, there is no middle-of-the-road developers fooling around with Cassandra absolutely, in 2010. Absolutely. So our mission as a company has been to change that, and I'm not going to turn this into a data stats commercial, but I can tell you, based on the keynote you saw yesterday with things like CQL mm -hmm. and us are taking now the drivers on board, we handled the hard stuff first. Now we're polishing and making it easier to adopt. But, um, but yeah, the credit where it's due. They do a phenomenal job of making a developer feel like a king. And we could learn a lot from them in that regard. And we're trying to learn a lot from them. We're trying to make sure that we um, are making that same kind of experience for our developers. So I'm going to come back on track here to kind of get us back into the, the sure. topic at hand. And so if we take a, a past this prologue and think about one of the last shifts we lived in that, that really accelerated the client server adoption for real into what I would call mission critical land was the push toward Y2K because we had no choice, right? We, we, we thought the world was going to end if we didn't rewrite these systems. And so why not take that time to write them off the mainframe? That gave uh, air cover to a lot of executives who are trying to push for change in their companies because now they could say, Y2K, I have to, I have to get it done. To my knowledge, we don't have a Y2K. We don't have a hard stop barrier at the moment that's going to give executives air cover to say, why I have to make this change. Do you see any other you know, compelling events on the horizon or just in the line of business that, that would give an exec air cover to say, this is why we have to start thinking differently about our databases. There's, there, there are intangible ones. Um, you know, there's the move to the cloud or to a virtualized environment so that you maximize your hardware investment. There's a move to uh, just the, the sheer mass of data we're collecting these days. We, we had a chat, does, does data drive the app or does the app drive the data? Well, some companies, they're just saying, okay, collect it all and we'll figure it out later. Uh, you know, th there's, that, there's that push as well. Uh, there's also, um, you know, the kind of applications uh, to analyze all that data, th they don't translate very well in, in a, in a sing to a single node RDBMS. You want, you want to, to push that, you, you don't want to take 24 hours to run a report, you want that report to run in one hour, and, and, and in holding all that in a single RDBMS is, is just not gonna uh, work for you. So there's all these things, eventually they're going to converge, and that's going to be the next Y2K. Uh, and, and there's not a hard date, it'll be a different day for different companies, but every company eventually is, is going to hit that point when all these three things converge, and, and, and again, they're going to have that uh-oh moment, and if they don't get ahead of, uh, ahead of that curve, then you know, they're, they're going to be stuck with, uh, with, with competition lapping them in, 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 in the market, and it's not going to be a comfortable place to be. I think, just to answer my own question, I think the compelling event is going to be, and is already upon us, uh, a resource drain. Well, that um, yeah. You are going to hit a point where you are going, you're not going to be able to hire mm -hmm. at the rate you're going to want to hire when you, when you suddenly know you need to hire. So if you don't get ahead of it now and figure out how you start bringing in the talent or transitioning your talent, then when you're ready to do it, it'll be too late. And you would not be able to, to hire fast enough to get these new kind of people and ramp them up fast enough to hit your market problem. Mm -hmm. And then you're in a real tough spot. You think you were at risk before, now you're gonna be at risk because literally your company dynamics are changing. 
And it's, um, we, we say a lot of tongue in cheek, we have a lot of fun with it. It's easy to pick on Oracle. I mean, they, they are a big fat target that everybody mm -hmm. likes. And, mm -hmm. and the reality is we are doing a lot of migrations from it. But the, the other thing that you gotta understand is, um, look at the headwinds they're facing from so many different directions, from the applications, which are now up against all these new cloud-based applications for ERPs and things like that. And then on the database side from us, on the development side with people wanting to use all these different languages and not just focus on one, um, that can be your company if you're a big company, right? If you're a startup company, you're already hiring fast and you get it. Like I know your situation, are you cranking fast and you're getting the top talent and you're trying it. But for people who are in more traditional organizations, um, you're gonna run out of that resource. And when you need to go to the gas, you're not gonna have any in the tank and, and it's gonna be tough. So Absolutely. Transition yeah. time, give, give me an idea on if you were gonna carve out, because um, not everybody will be willing, by the way, and that's mm -hmm. okay. In your developer and DBA organization, you're gonna have a percentage of people who are probably like my age, 42, 43, and they're gonna be like, you know what, no, I'm good. Like, I'm just gonna ride out the rest of my career as an Oracle DBA, and that's fine. But you're gonna have a percentage who are gonna say, I really wanna learn. What's transition time from a, a classically trained relational person to a fully functional, productive, Cassandra NoSQL person. I've asked a couple other people this. Yes. What's your estimation on that time? Uh, so we actually have data on that because we did make that shift. You guys have data on everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did make that shift. Um, my DB engineers uh, who were uh, classically trained Oracle DBAs and data architects, uh, it took them um, six months to a year to absolutely master I mean, they were they were up and running. Uh, they were up and running in weeks, and and started you know experimenting within a quarter, uh, and, and had things out there, but really mastered it, and, and really you know made that mind shift of you know from from relational to to, to NoSQL and Cassandra's NoSQL, um, uh, and and the fact that you know uh, the old tools you had aren't there anymore. So how do we overcome it? Uh, they went from complete zero to master in six months to a year. Now, th that's a testament to the caliber of those yeah, individuals, sure. but, um, I, you know, again, you have to get in there, you have to roll up your sleeves, you have to try it, you're gonna stumble, but I'd say, I'd say about two, three quarters. Two, three quarters, you, you should, I mean, uh, assuming they're, they're, they're real, real talented Oracle DBAs, they should be able, and they're willing, they should be able to, uh, to make that shift successfully. And uh, w w as far as your risk goes, I don't care what BU you run, I don't care which business unit you're over, I don't mm -hmm. care if you're over IT. Um, I can tell you right now, the biggest negative risk you face from an, op from an organizational perspective is the DBA group. So um, I, you may not think they have power, I can tell you on an informal org chart, your DBAs, like Christoph said earlier, they don't have the ability sometimes to go launch new things, but they have an amazing abort button. Their abort button is big and at the ready, and they can, they can retard your efforts very fast. And I've watched DBA groups, I've watched DBA groups where the executives <clears throat> didn't even know the name of an individual DBA. I've watched that individual DBA take down an executive through their network of power that you better be cognizant of. So that group in particular Absolutely. is a very yeah. powerful group and it's an important group but that's the negative side of it. The positive side of it is something you just touched on. Mm -hmm. Why did you stop calling them DBAs and start calling them DBEs? You start calling them database engineers. engineers. Why did you, you change that? So, um, because they're not just playing a role of managing the schema, making sure that your queries are, are running successfully and so on. They're actually now managing up, they're managing down and they're managing sideways. Uh, they need to learn the application. Uh, they need to understand uh, the access patterns, and I'm getting technical again, sorry about that, but they need to understand how the application works, so, and they need to be involved in now early on in the design phase of, of any application. So they're now engineers, they're not just administering something and making sure the lights are on, they're actually involved in, in, um, in, in, in really guiding the development because uh, you know, the great, uh, the easy thing about our DBMS was you've got this schema, you've got this relational schema, and now you can go in any direction. In NoSQL, you really need to know your application. You really need to know your access patterns. You I mean, when I mean you really, I mean you really, really, really need to understand your application. 
And so, uh, so these uh, ex-DBAs who, who are now involved in your schema design, they, they're engineers now. They're, they're, they're in there from day one of conception of, of, uh, of the application all the way to the deployment and then eventually maintenance as well. So, I mean, for me, they're not administ administrators anymore. They're engineers, so I call them DB engineers. And they're the ones embedding themselves in, at least at Netflix, they embed themselves in application groups and help with schema design, help with optimizing, uh, you know, application design as well. They're, they're, they're just not there for the persistence layer anymore. They're, they're a couple of layers up on the stack as well. That, that is such a great olive branch because you're, you're signaling to them you are, you are necessary. Yes. You're not just like we're gonna try and pull you around, but you're actually mm -hmm. necessary. And by the way, guys, you know, part of the reason why they're, they're pissed off about it, imagine how you'd feel if your title was one where you felt like everything that was happening around you in the company was one, you weren't the cool kid anymore, and two, by the way, you're gonna be obsolete. So once we make this transition, I don't know, because we had this world of what we used to call DevOps. Yeah. We had the developer and the operator, and it was like, DBAs, you don't get to come to the party. This is the developer world and the operator world. We're our own cool bunch. In fact, we've had some issues with you over the years where you've been the the no guy, <laughs> and so, you know what, good, you don't get to come to the table today. Now, now we get to play and we're gonna get back at you. That may sound trite, that may sound like I'm trying to be sensational, I promise you that is happening. Mm -hmm. If you're an organization of over a thousand people, that's happening in your organization. That thought process and that conversation is happening at some level in your DBA group. So if you reach out to them and say, no, 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 I actually need to repurpose your job. I need to take all your institutional knowledge and I need to make you a next level in this thing as an engineer because we need your knowledge and advice. You can't imagine what a difference that's going to make in terms of greasing the skids inside of your own company. Absolutely. It's just, it, I promise you it will help more than you realize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've covered a lot of ground. Let's, let's hit on, uh, give us the top three takeaways that you want people to remember from this. And with the overarching theme of they are facing risk, it yes. is real. Yes. Um, how do I do that without shooting myself in the foot as long as I'm uh, going along the way? What are the top three things you want people to remember? So um, it's okay to take risks. Uh, one, you know, uh, how much of a risk you take, uh, you know, you, you can actually throttle that by choosing the type of application you port uh, to, uh, to Cassandra or NoSQL. Uh, so that's one, uh, and, and I urge you, try it out, G get your developers engaged, uh, because the other risk is you do nothing, and then it, your, comp your competition's gonna lap you, and, um, and, and um, you know, you're just gonna be left behind, and, and that's a whole, and, and, and you know, you thought you were playing it safe by not taking the risk, that's a bigger risk than, than, than taking the risk of trying, uh, trying, uh, trying something out. And the third, which you touched upon a lot, is if you don't take that risk, you're gonna lose some very smart people, I'm gonna poach them, I'm gonna hire them, and uh, you know, you're gonna be stuck with the B and C team. Great. Okay, well, Christos, thank you very much. I want to give people time to go to their next session. So thanks for coming, guys, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.